faith in only the blood of the cross and the doctrine of incremental sanctification has never saved you wholly from your sins. Christians should know that they cannot be saved perfectly from their sins by believing only in Jesus' blood of the cross. Because people sin every day with their eyes and acts, they cannot blot out their sins just by believing in the blood of the cross alone. One of the most persuasive iniquities committed in people's lives nowadays is sexual immorality. As a culture of explicit and obscene sexuality pervades the world, this sin is ingrained in our flesh. The Bible commands not to commit adultery, but today's reality is that because of the circumstances that surround them, many people end up committing this sin even as they do not want to. God declares that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. Matthew's fifth chapter, verse 28. And yet what our eyes see every day is all obscene. So people are committing such lewd sins every minute and every second. When this is the case, how can they be sanctified by giving their prayers of repentance and enter the kingdom of God? How can they become righteous? Do their hearts become righteous when they discipline themselves for a long time and somehow get sanctified when they get old? Do their characters become meeker? Do they become more patient? Of course not. What happens is the exact opposite. Among the prevailing Christian doctrines is the doctrine of incremental sanctification. This doctrine holds that when Christians believe in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross for a long time, give prayers of repentance daily, and serve the Lord daily, then they gradually become holy and good-tempered. It claims that the more time goes by since we began to believe in Jesus, the more we are made into someone who has nothing to do with sin and whose deeds are virtuous, and that by the time death approaches us, we would have become completely sanctified and therefore completely sinless. And it also teaches that because we would have given our prayers of repentance all the time, we would have been washed of our sins every day as our clothes are washed. And therefore, when we die in the end, we go to God as someone who has become perfectly righteous. There are many who believe like this, but this is only a hypothetical speculation conjured up by man-made thoughts. Romans 5th chapter verse 19 says, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. The passage tells us that all of us are made sinless by one man's obedience. What you and I could not do, Jesus Christ achieved when he personally came to this earth. Knowing well that you and I could not free ourselves from sin, Jesus remitted our sins on our half, something that neither you nor I could ever do. By coming to this earth, 
receiving baptism, being crucified, and rising from the dead again, he has saved you and me and cleansed us from all our sins once for all. That Jesus Christ could give salvation to all his people by the remission of sin was made because he obeyed the will of God. Obeying God's will as the Messiah, Jesus Christ has bestowed on us the grace of salvation through his baptism, cross, and resurrection. By thus giving us the gift of salvation, Jesus fulfilled the remission of sin perfectly. And now, by faith, we have been clothed in the grace of this salvation. For the Lord has fulfilled our salvation from sin, which could never have been achieved by our own endeavors. However, most Christians do not believe in the baptism that Jesus received, but instead believe only in the blood that he shed on the cross and try to become sanctified through their own deeds. In other words, even as Jesus took upon all the sins of mankind when he was baptized by John, people still do not believe in this truth. Chapter 3 of Matthews tells us that the first thing that Jesus did in his public life was receiving the baptism from John. This is the truth attested by all the four gospel writers. Jesus took upon our sins by being baptized by John the Baptist the representative of mankind and the greatest of all who were born of women. And yet there are so many people who ignore this fact and do not believe in it. Such people believe in Jesus without believing in his baptism and fervently praise only the precious blood of the cross that he shed. Pained by the death of Jesus on the cross, they rouse up their emotions, make all kinds of racket in their praise, shouting out, There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. They try to go to God. In other words, fueled by their own emotions, vigor, and strength. But you must realize that the more they do so, the more hypocritical they become, pretending to be holy, but actually accumulating sins in their hearts in secrecy. How could we believe in Jesus as our Savior without even knowing the gospel of the water and the Spirit? When we hear people talking about the tabernacle, we often see that they don't even have the slightest clue as to what they are really talking about. When it comes to believing in the tabernacle, how can we just believe in whatever way we deem convenient and fitting? Because salvation from sin that the Lord has fulfilled is so elaborate. God has enabled us to realize how elaborately and how concretely our salvation has been fulfilled. Through the tabernacle, he has also made us realize that the Lord has saved us with the blue and purple threads, the water, and the blood. We come to realize that to blot out our sins, 
the Lord came not only by water, but by water and blood. 1 John 5th chapter, verse 6. The water, the blood, and the spirit in which we believe are one. It is by coming as a man, being baptized by John the Baptist, dying and rising from the dead again, that God has saved us. Through the tabernacle, we have been able to discover and believe in this detailed portrait of salvation. By studying the two tenons and two silver sockets of each board, we have come to realize the method by which Jesus has saved us from our sins. And we have thus found the truth that we must surely believe in the ministries of Jesus manifested in the blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Apart from the Bible, nowhere else can this salvation find its origin. We need the gift of salvation that is made of these two elements of baptism and the cross. Those who believe in this truth can then become the ones who are born of God. By delivering us from our sins with the water and the spirit, God has fulfilled our salvation perfectly. Two tenons, in other words, were made under each board and plugged into two silver sockets. This truth is absolutely necessary and tremendously important for us and our remission of sin. Most critically, we must believe in our salvation that God has completed for us. For if we do not believe in the truth of the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, we can never be saved. As each board of the Holy Tabernacle needed two silver sockets to stand upright, when it comes to believing in Jesus Christ, two truths of His grace are absolutely necessary. What are they? They are that Jesus took upon our sins by being baptized and that he bore all the condemnation and curses of our sins by carrying them to the cross and by being crucified. Whoever is made righteous can be made so only when he or she wholly believes in these two graces of perfect salvation. Our faith in both the baptism of Jesus and the blood of the cross, the two pivots of his gift of salvation, make us stand firmly in the house of God. As the two tenons were put into the two silver sockets, each bore could stand upright. Like this, it is by our correct faith that believes in the two pivots of his salvation that we are made truly blameless people. By believing in the gospel of the water and the blood given by Jesus, we receive faith like gold that is forever unchanging. By believing in this gospel of the water and the spirit manifested in the blue, purple, and scarlet thread and the fine woven linen, we become the saints who have received the salvation of the perfect remission of sin. Theology until now and the age of the gospel of the water and the spirit excluding the early church period, since the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, Christianity, including today's Christianity, has been spreading the gospel of the cross that leaves Jesus' baptism out. 
from the early church period to 313 AD, which legalized Christianity as the new Roman religion, Christianity had preached the gospel of the water and the spirit. But afterward, the Roman Catholic Church came to dominate the religious scene. Then from the early 14th century, a culture that centered everything on man-made thoughts and called for the restoration of humanity began to emerge. First, in some prosperous city-states of northern Italy, this was Renaissance. By the 16th century, the undercurrent of this culture that began in Italy started to spread throughout the Western world and scholars who studied humanistic, man-made philosophy began to study theology. Interpreting the Bible with their own heads, they began to build Christian doctrines. But because they did not know the truth, they could not understand the Bible soundly and wholly. So what they could not understand with their heads, they overcame by incorporating their secular knowledge and thoughts, thus producing their own Christian doctrines. As a result, a multitude of Christian doctrines and theologies arose in Christian history. Lutheranism, Calvinism, Arminism, New Theology Conversism, Rationalism, Critical Theology, Mystical Theology, Liberation Theology, Feminist Theology, Black Theology, and even atheistic theology. The history of Christianity may seem very long, but it actually is not that long. For 300 years since the early church period, people could learn about the Bible, but this was soon followed by the medieval age, the dark age of Christianity. During this era, for laymen reading the Bible itself was a crime punishable to death by being beheaded. It was not until the 1700s when the wind of theology began to blow and then Christianity seemed to blossom in the 1800s and 1900s as its theologies grew vibrant and active but now many people have fallen into mystical doctrines, believing in God based on their own personal experiences. But despite its theological diversities, all the branch streams of Christianity have one common denominator of faith. That is, believing in only the blood of Jesus. But is this the truth? When you believed in this way, did your sins actually disappear? You sin every day. You sin every day with your hearts, thoughts, acts, and shortcomings. Can you then be remitted of these sins just by believing only in the blood that Jesus shed on the cross? Jesus shouldered our sins by being baptized and died on the cross is the biblical truth. Yet there are so many people who say that their sins have been remitted by believing only in the blood of the cross and giving their prayers of repentance every day. Were the sins of your hearts and conscience cleansed away by giving such prayers of repentance, this is impossible. If you are Christians, then you must now know and believe in the salvation of this truth, 
that Jesus Christ came to this earth and took upon our sins of the world by being baptized by John. In spite of this, do you yet ignore this truth, not even trying to know it nor to believe in it? If so, you are committing the sin of mocking Jesus, of lowering and despising his name, and you cannot say that you truly believe in Jesus as your Savior. By leaving out Jesus' baptism from this salvation fulfilled by Jesus Christ and believing in him in whatever way that you want, you can never be clothed in the grace of salvation. Yet many Christians do not believe in this truth as it is that Jesus has blotted out our sins, but instead follow their own thoughts and believe in whatever twisted truths they want to believe. Nowadays, their hearts have been hardened more and more by their mistaken doctrinal faith, believing that their sins can be blotted out just by believing in the blood of the cross alone. But the answer of salvation planned by God is as the following. We can receive the everlasting remission of sin by believing in Jesus' baptism, his death on the cross, and his resurrection. Yet there have risen a countless number of people who believe in Jesus by taking out his baptism from this truth of salvation misunderstanding and misbelieving the following equation to be an immutable law. Jesus, the cross and his resurrection, plus prayers of repentance, plus virtuous deeds equals salvation received through incremental sanctification. Those who believe in this way are only saying with their lips that they have received their remission of sin. However, the truth is that their hearts are actually filled with heaps of sin that still remain unsolved. Do you still have sins in your hearts? If you have sin in your hearts, even as you now believe in Jesus, then clearly there is a serious problem with your faith. It is because you believe in Jesus merely as a matter of religion that your conscience are not clean and have sin. However, the very fact that you can realize you still have sin remaining in your hearts is extremely fortunate in itself. Why? Because those who truly realize that they have sin will recognize that they cannot avoid but be bound to hell for the sin. And when they do, they can finally become the poor in spirit and thereby be able to hear the word of true salvation. If you want to receive the remission of sin from God, then your hearts must be prepared. Those whose hearts are ready before God admit, God, I want to receive the remission of sin. I have believed in Jesus for a long time, but I still have sin. Because the wages of sin is death, I cannot but be cast into hell. Like this, they recognize themselves as wholly sinful before God. Those who recognize the word of God, those who believe that the word of God is surely fulfilled exactly as it says, none other than these are the ones whose hearts are ready. God meets such souls without exception. Such people hear his word, see the word with their own eyes and confirm it. And from doing so, 
they come to realize, ah, I had believed mistakenly. And a countless number of people are believing mistakenly now. And by believing in the gospel of the water and the spirit, regardless of what others might say, they then receive their remission of sin. Those who have been saved from all their sins must defend their faith by believing in the gospel of the water and the spirit. However, this world is full of countless evil doctrines that can unsettle and defile even the hearts of the born again. The Lord Jesus warned us, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Mark 8, chapter, verse 15. But we cannot even count just how many such leavened teachings there are, defiling people's hearts just by hearing only once. We must realize just how this world is waving in sexual immorality. We who believe must know exactly in what kind of age we are now living and defend our faith. Yet, even as we live in such a sinful world, in our hearts is the unaccessible truth that the Lord has delivered us from sin. The word of testimony that bears witness to our unchanging salvation is the gospel of the water and the spirit. We must have faith in the truth that is neither shaken by the world nor dragged by it. Everything from this world is not the truth. God told us that the righteous overcome the world. It is by their faith in the gospel of the unchanging truth that the righteous overcome the devil and triumph over the world. Though we are insufficient, our hearts, our thoughts, and our bodies are still in the house of God and are standing firmly on the gospel of salvation with faith. We are standing steadfastly on the gospel of the water and the blood with which the Lord has saved us. Because of this, we are so thankful to God. No matter how sin abounds in this world, at least we the righteous truly have spotless consciences and faith that shined like gold in our hearts. We the righteous will all live a life that overcomes the world by this faith. Until the day of the Lord's return, and even as we are in his kingdom, all of us will praise this faith. We will forever praise the Lord who has saved us and praise our God who has given us this faith. As this truthful faith that we have with us before God is raised on the rock, it is not shaken under any circumstances. As such, no matter what happens to us as we live on this earth until the day we stand before the Lord, we will defend our hearts by faith. Even if everything in this world is destroyed, even if this world is drowning in sin, and even if this world becomes worse than Sodom and Gomorrah of the old, we will not follow this world, but we will believe in God chastely. 
We will pursue his righteousness and we will continue to do the works that spread these two graces, the baptism of Jesus and his death on the cross of salvation, the true graces of God.